We will start the webinar in five minutes from now. So please hold on. The webinar will start in two minutes from now. Hello everyone, welcome to Canfi's webinar, Measuring and Reducing Pathogens in Hospitals. We are impressed by the number of attendees with the global presence. The webinar will be 60 minutes and the last 10 minutes we have for questions that you are able to type down or chat and questions area panel. Panelist today is myself, Anders Jelström, Global Air Quality Manager. And me, Patrick Jansson, Global Business Development Manager, Air Cleaner. And myself, uh, Neil McElwee, Director of Capital Projects in the States, St. James's Dub Hospital in Dublin. Agenda for the hospital webinar today is the indoor air quality effects on human body, particulate matter and definitions, indoor air quality function within a hospital, and filter standards. External contamination sources, how they can get into the hospital. 
filtering clean room standards, internal contamination, how to create better in our air quality through air distribution, and identifying problems and solutions by case study references. Let us do some definition of indoor air quality like VSU has done. Indoor air quality refers to the quality of air inside buildings as represented by concentrations of pollutants and thermal conditions that affect the health, comfort and performance of occupants. The essence of air has puzzled the most incisive thinkers from Aristotle and Da Vinci and beyond that. But despite the fact that more than 2000 years have elapsed since we started, air related is still here with several misconceptions. And also air related diseases are increasing at an ever faster rate. Seven to 10 million people die every year of air related sicknesses. The emission from these and other pollutions we convey in our homes, workplaces, schools and nurseries and hospitals. Eventually it ends up in the alveole as we see here in the picture and further into our bloodstream. In the alveoli, in the most sensitive part of our respiratory system, air and blood meet. If this encounter is prevented, the basis of life ceases to exist. Therefore, it's time to distinguish between fresh air and clean air. The marvelous picture from Dr. Leonard Nilsson shows the alveoli in the end of our respiratory system. We could see the cluster of these cells inside the alveoli. Behind the blue wall, we have the limbs and the blood wings. The oxygen and unfortunately also the smallest ultrafine particles passes the human filter and ends up into the blood. Carbon dioxide are transported out through this alveolar sac. This organism, phytoplankton, is really a savior for us humans. It produces nearly 75% of all oxygen on Earth living under the ocean surface. We have around 700 million alveoli in our body and the surface is in total 70 square meters. In one breath in an urban area, a normal outdoor air, we breathe around 25 million particles. The smallest particles, as we saw in Leonard Nielsen's uh, picture, uh, passes the last barrier the before the blood. And our defense, the macrophages, which is inside a sac, dies if they get too much of particles and emissions and they release mediators and an allergy or more severe reaction starts. In a quality in hospital should protect patient and healthcare workers, of course. Certified filters could prevent building related illness such as headache, fatigue, eyes and skin reactions and prevent contamination of diseases from viruses or bacteria. Every day you eat one kilo of food. Every day you drink two to three kilo of liquid. Every day you breathe 15 kilo of air. According to Professor Magnus Wattinger, report of mortality in particles shows that particles smaller than 2.5 microns or smaller is linked to increased mortality. It's a few days of increased hospital admissions caused by air pollution. This due to the incubation period after the particles are inhaled to create illness. This diagram shows the particle deposition in the body, which I think is very important to show, by particle size. So if one kilo of sand and one kilo of stone have the same weight, but the sand has thousand times larger surface than the stone, so the smallest particulates has higher risk to start harmful processes for humans inside the body. Human lungs and airway system has its own deposition curve, as you can see in the blue graph. The largest particle deposited in the upper airway, the medium particle size have the lowest deposition factor, and the smallest ultrafine and nano particles deposit in the alveoli or even ends up in the cardiovascular system. This uh, could be a boring diagram, but it's very important. This diagram shows the distribution of particles in the air by mass and by number. The green line is particles by weight and the red by number. 99% of all particles in air by number is sized around 0.05 micron. Legislation is taking care of the PM10 or down to PM2, which is only some percentage of the number of particles. However, by weight, it is the opposite. Then we have to consider that a small amount of particles that is represented by the large ones is mostly short times effect on health. And the smallest is probably creating long time health effects. 
some of you already know the magnitude of size of a human down to a virus, but let us get a picture of that in, in real life. Here you can see a human. First, you could see on the skin, on the surface, on the epithelial level, it's about one centimeter or 10 millimeter. And then we could, in uh, very, very close, we could see, soon we will see the bacteria and the green ones. We are down to about 10 microns, and the, and the bacteria size could be one to three microns. And the surface of the bacteria, you have the virus from 100 nanometer and even down to then one nanometer on the receptor on the virus. That's a big, huge magnitude. When I wrote you a nail, scientists did a study nearby highway with mouse um, during one day, inhaling different size of particles. The reaction of oxidative stress occurred, as you can see on the picture there. The result was more intensive for the smaller ultra fine, as you can see on the, on the right rat. As you see then went further and deeper down into the blood system. Particles and dust have to be around 40 to 50 microns to be visible to a human eye. Hair is around 70 micron. Pollen is around 50 micron. Spores bacteria, 3 to 10 micron. So let us go into the particle mass definition. PM10 is the mass concentration of particles with an aerodynamic diameter less than 10 micron expressed in microgram per cubic meter. PM2.5 is the mass concentration of particles with an aerodynamic diameter less than 2.5 micron expressed in microgram per cubic meter. And PM1 is the mass concentration of particles with an aerodynamic diameter less than 1 micron expressed also in microgram per cubic meter. But that, that's the difference also between PM1, 2.5 and 10. PM2.5 and 10, they move mostly with the wind mainly from sources far away. It could be from industrial areas, from polluted areas, from other countries. And PM1 is often locally based and generated from diesel and other combustion in three to 400 meters from where you are. And PM1, 75 to 80% of all mass weight uh, concerning 2.5 is on PM1. So that is why it's, it's so important to measure PM1. And of course, the correlation between PM1 and ultrafines is really obvious. And also PM1 and NO2 correlate. Let us look at the size and sicknesses. We could see here in the range, in virus range from 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 micron, we have pneumonia, smallpox, we have diesel exhaust, we have smoke. In the bacteria range, we have tobacco smoke, uh, cat dander, influenza and tuberculosis. And in the spores range, we have uh, strep, anthrax, and coal dust and asbestos. As you heard during Anders' presentations, it's a complex situation we need to deal with. Manage cross-contamination, control the filtration need in air movement within a building. It's crucial to have clean air. This is a schematic drawing of an HVAC unit and its air movement. In the arrow number one, air is coming from the outdoor air untreated. In the arrow, arrow number two, air is being filtrated through a classified filter in one or several filter steps. And in the arrow number three, air is passing through a heat exchanger. And in number four, you can see air will be supplied to the room. On the other side of the HVAC unit, we have air exhaust from the room, and then the exhaust air is being filtrated through classified filter in one or several filter steps. And then air again is passing through an heat exchanger. Then filtrated air and heat exchange air return to the outer air. That's how an HVAC units have as basic function. ISO 16890 is the new ISO standard for testing comfort filter. It's a huge dif filtration difference between EPM 2.5 and EPM 1, even if the efficiency percentage looks the same. In the picture, you see correlation between particle sizes. 
if a 10 micron particle would have the size of a sperm wave, the elephant is equal to a 2.5 micron particle. The human is equal to one micron particle. Now we look how far different particle sizes are able to get into the human body. Particle size of 10 micron could even stop in a mustache or in the throat. Particles smaller than 2.5 could reach the lungs. And one micron could reach the alveoli. But 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 microns could penetrate the alveoli through the lymph system and reach the blood. How to choose filter according to EN16798-3? This matrix shows the recommended filter choice in supply air according to EN16798-3. This covers both particle filters and the molecular filters. The concept is to have the right filter combination according to the outdoor air pollution to match your desired indoor air quality. So this slide shows the removal of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that the Stockholm University and Canfield did. <clears throat> it's a straight correlation then between toxic exposure and filter efficiency. On the left hand, you see the, uh, the blue scale and the uh, I-axis, that's the PAH levels. And on, on the X-axis, you could see the sizes of particles. So it is like this, a certified F7 filter reduce 60% of PAH from outdoor air, and uh, the same, they also reduce 60% of the particulates. But a certified M6 filter only reduced 20% of the PAH uh, and 40% uh, of the particles. That's something to remember. In this picture, we see with all the white arrows have air is applied to a building. Please look at the animation of how air is entering into the building from the air diffusers. Red arrow shows where and how air could be exhausted through different type of rooms. Please look at animation of how particle will be extracted from the room into the HVAC unit as we explained before. Uncontrolled air enters a building by open windows with construction side or highways outside. Contamination through elevators, it's a common source of uncontrolled air in a building. And unwanted leakages in the construction of a building. Here you could see a snapshot of hospital air quality standards, some global and some local. Campbell have the knowledge of the local standards applicable for your hospital. We will not have time to look into details in the different standards, but we'll show a few ones. Snapshot of standards for filters and clean room. This slide shows four different tables. To the left, we have the ISO class for clean room. To the right, we have the number of validation points depending on size of the clean room. And down to the left, we have the filter efficiency according to EN 1822. And finally, the number of recommended limits for microbiological contamination. Arkin is a perfect solution for ISO 7 to ISO 9 and where no laminar airflow is needed. Arkin filters is equipped with filter H13 and have a filter efficiency of 99.9% .9 at least. In addition to particles, there are also standards applicable for chemicals, viable, nanoparticles, and surfaces. Let us for some minute talk about which kind of filter you should use for outdoor air coming in or concerning particles. Today we have started to implement a new filter standard, ISO 16890, and it's based on value from 0.3 micron up to 10 expressed in white. In the blue sector we show the EP and 2.5 range for filter tests, and the gray line shows the, the efficiency of EP and 2.5, 75%. But in the dark blue sector, you see the EP1 range for filter test, and the green line shows the efficiency of EP1 
However, in the red sector, you see the range of MPPS particle according to EN 1822. This is the same range as where as the most harmful particles enter our body. So the red line in the top shows the particle efficiency of a HEPA filter. If you look in the red zone, on the gray and the green line, we see a huge difference in the efficiency on the F7 and the M6, to the benefit for F7 with 30%. And finally, we have the size range of virus and bacteria like pneumonia, tuberculosis, and which shows an important good classified filters. Inside a the hospital, there's a lot of different sources and pollution. Some of them you could see here on the left hand. The microbial cloud is a very important issue and must be controlled due to its effect. To test the individualized personal cloud, University of Oregon researchers sequenced microbes from the air surrounding 11 different people in sanitized chambers. The study found that most of the occupants sitting alone in the chamber could be identified within four hours just by a unique combination of bacteria in the surrounding air. So, the main polluter is us, 10 million particles per minute. 10 million particles per minute. All humans could then be identified through the personal fingerprint over microbial cloud. Three solutions to improve indoor air quality in hospitals. In one way, we could create positively pressurized rooms, or we could create negatively pressurized rooms, or we can use recirculation with HEPA filter according to EN 1822. We start with a positive pressurized room, and it, in the picture, I'll explain how to retrofit or help existing HVAC units in making a positively pressurized room and its effect. The concept of creating positively pressurized rooms is to ensure that the air introduced to the room is clean and that any air that does escape will not affect other patients or staff. In hospitals, the quality of air introduced into the room is not only important for the patient within the room, but also for the doctors and nurses that works in the room. In the square box, you see a room within a building and its different air pattern. If you look at the solution number one up to the left, is the internal air cleaning configuration. So you have an air cleaner inside the room, the red arrow shows the air coming through the 813 filter, and the blue and the green arrow shows the positive pressure that we create with the clean air. In solution number two, as you can see in the right corner, is the external air cleaning configuration. So you can actually have a unit on the other side of the wall of the room, duct it into the room and supply the HEPA filtrated air into the room, and then you create the overpressure in the room. That could be released through the door in the room or through leakages in the construction. A couple of positive effects by creating this overpressure is aspergillus prevention works, improved patient room conditions, upgrading low immune patients' environments, and no need to audit the whole HVAC balancing when not using outdoor air. One example how we could do this is to grant aspergillus ingress during construction at St. James's Hospitals. In the left picture, we see a concealed unit installed with heating at the air inlet. This picture is during the installation with the metal box visible. And here you can see the picture of the unit concealed with only the supply grid visible. In the picture to the right, we see inducted air cleaner placed in a window to save floor space. Here I hand over to, to Neil to look deeper into the St. James's Hospital project. Hello, um, I hope you can hear me okay. So we have uh, just to get the video going. It's a little video slide. Well, that's starting to progress. I'll just give you a, a short overview of St. James's Hospital in Dublin. St. James's Hospital is an, an inner city Dublin site. Um, it is uh, over 60 acres. Uh, for those on the metric, it's uh, 24.3 hectares in size. 
and it is the uh, our largest acute teaching hospital in Ireland with over 1,000 beds and five, four and a half thousand staff um, at the facility on a daily basis. Um, being the largest acute teaching hospital, um, we have currently major construction works going on to provide for the new National Children's Hospital. And on the map uh, site you see in front of you there on the left hand side is the uh, 12 acres or 4.8 hectares being provided for the development of the National Children's Hospital. Within our campus, we have uh, uh, the range of different services. Um, so what we had to do before the implementation of uh, any of the construction works uh, in the campus was to understand what the risks were for this happening in a, a large acute teaching hospital. The definition of risk is there listed in front of you and the most common and most risk uh, contaminants are airborne uh, pathogens uh, related to aspergillosis. And aspergillosis, as you may or may not understand, is, is commonly occurred in the soil from um, uh, enriched debris and decaying vegetation, but it's also quite common in relation to uh, demolition sites, in the ceiling voids of buildings, um, and also uh, related to the uh, transplant of um, human uh, garden materials into the uh, clean room areas. So invasive aspergillosis is primarily an infection of the severely immunocompromised patients, patients with hematology malignancies and undergoing intensive remission induction containers. So what we had to do is uh, we had to carry out a uh, risk assessment, a clinical risk assessment of the site. Um, our campus being a thousand beds with day surgery, outpatients, a footfall of approximately 10,000 persons per month. And with excavations going to be taking place on the campus of approximately 430,000 cubic meters being excavated for the Children's Hospital, we needed to understand uh, what measures need to be put in place for to control that risk. The building wards are naturally ventilated wards. So into, to introduce a isolation or control environment for our at-risk patients, we needed to carry out uh, a, a study on this. The construction and renovation activities are clustered in four main groups. Um, and these are part of the national guidelines for noscomal aspergillosis happening in healthcare environment. A document that we can make available for, for you if you so require. The uh, internal works listed on the left hand side is dealing with the general uh, repairs and maintenance, uh, uh, ventilation components, uh, where, work, where there's disturbance of, of dust particles that will be floating in the airborne uh, environment of the risk patients. And that extends right to the major external, which deals with the major soil excavation, demolitions of buildings and new build. In our assessment, our clinical assessment, we had to understand the different groups of risks of our population of patients. Group one related to staff members and contractors, and that would include where staff members uh, may uh, be going through a chemotherapy treatment themselves, but also for their own for their own risk uh, consideration. Uh, for group two, we had the severely immunosuppressed patients. A patients undergoing uh, mechanical ventilation or respiratory treatment, non neutropenic patients on chemotherapy, dialysis patients, and, and others, right through to group three, which includes patients with neutropenia for less than 14 days following chemotherapy, solid organ transplantation, including um, uh, lung transplant, heart, heart cardiac, thoracic, uh, and also bone marrow transplant. Neonates in intensive care at all, so would be in, in that category. For group four, very high risk will be alterogenic hypothermic stem cell transplantation, children with severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome, uh, and, and other things of that category. So, in our risk assessment, uh, again, this detail is, is provided in, in the guidelines. We, we uh, classified 
uh, our control program to carry out works within the ward areas. To, to do that, we um, carried out Asperger's prevention works by emptying out the ward and looking at the single rooms and the multiple rooms to provide for clean air um, systems into the room with minimum disturbance. Those clean air, clean filtered air, had to, to meet with the standards as set out earlier by my colleagues to deal with particle filters down to the high risk, uh, smallest particle sizes of the EPM1. So in our, in our group of works, we uh, carried out ser ser several areas um, of baseline studies. So looked at the wards, looked at what was available in terms of the event, the, the study, the pre-work assessments. The key particle ranges between 0.3 to 0.5 microns. Um, we looked at the uh, test run of a case in certain wards um, before the work started. And then with the introduction of the filter unit, how that re dramatically reduced the number of uh, particle count, fine particle count over the period of 15 minutes running in these fine air filters. Um, we then looked at the different areas of the campus and in particular outside where there's uh, contaminants floating generally in the air from the construction sites potentially, but also being an inner city site with uh, significant traffic movement, uh, normal construction activities that will be happening in the city dwellings. Um, and we, we took studies over uh, every two weeks to identify the actual type of aspergillus numbers in volume. I must say the particle count on the previous baseline study is related to the volume and numbers of particles, not specific to the actual uh, type of particles, where our own studies then carried out later looked at the actual type of uh, particles and what was in those particles, being them the aspergillosis fungibatis, fungamas gamas, and also the uh, azole resi resistant uh, aspergillus. We looked at uh, then sites related to where we have high-risk patients, the Dennis Burkett Ward, uh, and also in the concourse areas of uh, where patients will be walking about uh, and visitors coming into the outpatient areas. Over the two week periods, you can see the dramatic uh, increase in spikes of uh, colony forming units in those areas. Um, and then we move to the when the construction work started. So we after we closed John Houston Ward um, for the period of uh, four weeks for to carry out these works, we could see a dramatic decrease then in the colony, colony forming units of aspergillosis in those wards. Those works then continued on. We had about 15 different areas, 15 different wards, approximately 31 beds in every ward, carried over the period of a 12 month to 15 month period. The results of those actions meant that there was no increased cases of noscomial aspergillosis in those wards. There was minimum ward downtime, because as you can understand from the hospital operations teams and bed management teams, um, without having a controlled environment for those at-risk patients, the, the, it limits the capacity to provide a suitable care environment for those patients. So having these controlled wards now completed, it allowed for a uh, sustained um, bed management for those immune suppressed patients. Minimum patient disruption was then uh, a result of it, and also a minimum staff and patient complaints risks levels and management by staff. In relation to the, the, the patient complaints, the predominantly because of being a naturally ventilated ward areas, we had to seal up all the windows, we had to seal up all the um, egress points for dust particles to enter into the hospital buildings. Um, and therefore, without uh, mechanical ventilated systems, we had to introduce these air cleaners to provide air movement, fresh air cleaned uh, and in, into the safe area. Over the continuous actions of the project, then we continue to do fortnightly monitoring while building works are continued. The expectation of that period is for the next five years and also continuous training for contractors and staff and patients 
in relation to the risks of aspergillosis um, in terms of their visiting times, what they're wearing going into those high-risk areas, and general uh, cleaning environment um, from uh, the uh, patient controlled areas. The other aspect of it is in terms of patient awareness uh, for their families and visitors when they move out of the control zones, wearing face masks where required, but also to, to minimize the time outside where that exposure exists. Benefits by using these products in positive pressurized is, for example, improved ISO class clean room, protecting patient health. We have the patent dual intake, which makes two air clean in one. We have the certified HEPA filter and low noise levels. Air cleaners from Camflo are perfect retrofit or complement existing air handling units. We have three, six different models that is perfect for creating this type of solution and have an airflow between 300 to 6,000 cubic meters capacity. Besides certified particle filter, we also have certified molecular filter according to ISO standard. The units are patented. Besides dual intake, we also have a sensor system that monitors your indoor air quality. It raises and lowers the air operating level of your air cleaners, depending on the amount of particles in the air, saving you energy and precise increased protection for people and equipment. This is a smart air cleaner that connects to user interface and building management systems. In this picture, I'll explain how we easy can create a negatively pressurized room and its effect. Instead of supplying air to the room as in positive pressurized room, we here exhaust the air to create the positively pressurized rooms. In hospital, creating negatively pressurized rooms is a key requirement to protect the health of hospital patients and staff or sterile equipment. As the air in negative pressure room is often hazardous to other patients, the idea is to take the contaminated air from the room clean it, and distribute the clean air to a non-critical area. In solution number one, as you can see in the upper right corner, is the external room configuration. So you have the air cleaner on the other side of the room, ducted through the wall, and you exhaust air from the room to create the negative pressure. Then you're able to release it either to the outdoor air or to the other room on the other side of the wall. In solution number two, as you can see in the lower right, lower right corner, is the internal room air cleaner placed inside the room. So you will take the air through the filters in the room, duct it through the wall, and supply the air on the other side of the wall. And you can see the air of, in the door that here we have created a negative pressurized room. Camphill Air Cleaner can easily upgrade hospital facilities to create negative pressure room. Some of the positive effects protect these sensitive people, protect people from dangerous diseases, prevent contamination. Example of room installation, and here I will hand over to Neil again. Okay, and examples there, it releases two waiting rooms for the emergency department, radiology waiting rooms, triage, Airborne infection isolation, cytology, uh, glass washing, histology, microbiology, nuclear medicine, pathology, sterilizing, um, the, the, the other areas related to uh, the fact where you've got air, the airborne infectious diseases where you have patients that may be having uh, tuberculosis, uh, fluenza, um, and this, this is an example of the typical rooms for negative pressure. Oh, great. Thank you, Neil. I think we can move to the next slide. Retrofit for higher legislation demands in Holland. Reason for doing this installation was the WIP guideline and the TNO report. Three important aspects for air cleaning to fit perfect as a retrofit into these guidelines was in Appendix C.2, air tightness isolation rooms. Our conceal can function as a booster fan, including A13 filters. Therefore, no other changes have to be made. Appendix C, point three, concealed can function as an exhaust system because of the fact that we're able to control the amount of airflow. It's mandatory to filter the outgoing air with 813 filter, which is standard in our units. On page 27, point one, 
it's mandatory to be able to validate the HEPA filters. That is no problem for our concealed unit either. So why patient in isolation? I think here I will hand over to Neil again. Okay, thank you. Um, the isolation can be in two di different situations. Patient that has very low resistance, immune suppression system due to uh, chemotherapy treatment um, from uh, patients with those with uh, um, a prolonged neutropenia, lung transplant recipients that I've listed earlier before, and also patients that have uh, um, airborne in infectious dis diseases such as the, the, the tuberculosis, influenza, um, those patients that are also going through where uh, they have radioiodine treatment, um, uh, their immune suppression system would uh, require for total separation, both the clinical and also from uh, an airborne transfer uh, risk. Um, the the other decisions I think we'll be coming back to some other time, some another time will be related to the positive um, pressure positive pressure rooms and negative pressure rooms and the studies currently going on um, in, in this country and in the UK related to positive pressure ventilated lobbies and which way they would be moving forward but that's that's for another date. Okay thank you very much. Our clean benefit for negative pressurize as a few examples is controlled airflow, removal of harmful particle, low noise level and lower risk assessment. Recirculating standalone units is the most common installation for air cleaners in hospitals. The concept of creating recirculating with HEPA filter and molecular filter is overused to increase or maintain isoclass, reduce odor issues, or create better in air quality. In hospital, besides particles, there are many different odor and gases that can either affect patient and staff health or slow down, slow down productivity. As you can see in the blue circle, a standalone unit is in the room. The red arrow symbolizes the air going through the filters, and the green arrow is the supplied clean air. And you only work with the room that the air cleaner is in. Just circulate it number of time of the room volume. We have several positive effects by recirculating HEPA and molecular filtrated air, as increased isoclass, odor remover, formaldehyde removal in laboratory, pathology labs, or hydrogen peroxide removal. In this graph, we see the reduction in number of particles at the size of 0.3 to 0.5 microns, and the time axis is only 15 minutes. This is a good example of how easy it can be to reduce the number of particles to ISO 7 level, 8 level by using a 13 filter in a recirculating air clean. In the beginning where you see the pointer, it was 12 million. And after 50 minutes, we reach 500,000. And you can see the green line is the ISO 8 level for a clean room. In this slide, we want to show how it's possible to remove odor in hospital. And in this specific case, we removed odor in chemotherapy treatment rooms at Roskilde Hospital in Denmark. It's well known that chemotherapy patients after transplantation of stem cell for regenerating the bone marrow in the following days gives off a very strong and unpleasant smell, which make it almost impossible for the healthcare staff to stay in the treatment room. HVAC could not solve this problem. After analyzing the complex mix of substances of liquid which was flushed into the patient and generates the odor, we selected the perfect combination of molecular media to adsorb the gas molecules that generate the smell. Solution was just recirculating air cleaner with molecular and A13 filter. And keep in mind, the patient themselves does not smell this odor. It's for the nurses and the staff. We have mentioned molecular filter several times in this presentation. And this type of filter are used to remove odor, smell, or hazardous gases. Instead of mechanically filtrate particles, molecular media adsorbs gases and solvents. A variety of molecular media exist depending on target gas to trap, as you can see in the picture to the left. Just one gram of molecular media 
have up to 3,000 square meters of surface in the micropore structure, as in the picture in the middle. In the final picture, we see how molecules are trapped in their micropore structure. Remember to always ask for the molecular test standard when, when considering molecular filtration. In this example, I'll describe how removal of hydrogen peroxide saves money at Sydland Medical Center. Hydrogen peroxide is being used to decontaminate nursing rooms, recovery rooms, operating theaters, etc. This process takes about one hour, depending on the size and the contaminant. In this particular case, we had a room volume of 32 cubic meters and normally it takes 12 to 48 hours before being able to use the room after decontaminating according to legislation demands. Legislation limits to enter a room with hydrogen peroxide is as follows. Level of 6 ppm is required for personnel to enter the room. Level of 1 ppm required to enter the room and start to use it. And by using molecular filter, in 2.5 hours, the personnel was able to enter the room and we had reached a value of 4 ppm. This saves up to 45.5 hours to start using the room after decontamination. Example, again, we can see here of recirculation units in hospital and a lot of benefits by using those products, improved hospital room condition, dual air filtration, low noise level, small footprint, odor removal, and smart air cleaner and connectivity to user interface or building management system. Here we have uh, two facilities and three different filtration uh, solutions. The outdoor air concentration in this case is the same for both of them. It's 150 million over 0.4 micron particles. On the grey house with the M6 filter, with the EPM 2.5 filter, efficiency gives 120 million of particles entering the building through the HVA system. The F7 filter on the green house with the EPM 1 efficiency gives 60 million of particles entering the building through the HVAC system. But, but adding and by using an air cleaner with the EN 1822 certified filter, you are able to achieve nearly 9.5 million of particles in the room. So it's up to you. Here we have a summary of previous slide. And if you use an M6 filter, you will have 120 million inside the house. And if you use an F7 filter, you will have 60 million particles inside the house. And if you add a recirculating unit with A30 filter, you will have 9.5 million of particles. So filter matters. So, and so it is. Uh, so if you have any questions, and also we have got some questions, Jesper, isn't so? Yes. So. The first question of the day is, what tool do Canful use to measure particles in the air? Actually, we use several tools for that. We could either use particle counting for defined clean room levels, which measuring particle infractions. And then we have the air image sensor that measuring the particles uh, and it's, able, it's possible to show the measured value on the web interface. And the second question is, do HEPA filter really filtrate down to 0 0.1 microns? My answer is yes, of course. But uh, there is an MPPS level, so that's a misunderstanding often in, in the business that uh, the HEPA filters filtrate down to 0 0.3. It's not like that. We have the Operation theater, we are on Mars, we are on Moon, we are everywhere. So it filtrates down to the smallest viruses. That's yes. Third question: Could a 2.5 micron particle enter alveoli region with a high breathing pace? If you are a Norwegian skating or skiing, then I, I could uh, think that they are they're possible to do, but they will never, never pass the barrier into the bloodstream because it must be 0 0.05 or smaller. Fourth question is, is there any tools available to help control the particles in the air? 
Yeah, actually, that the controller particle is if if you could use the air image sensor, we can connect that to air cleaner. So depending on the the value inside the room, we will control the air cleaners to have our desired uh, indoor air quality. So, and then other question is, what do we have here? Yes, we have one more question here. Could bacteria on the surface of HEPA filters start other reaction when plugged on the filter? To be honest, if you have a glass fiber or synthetic, uh, there's not any embolism starting uh, on the HEPA surface filters. Of course, after some time, you have to change the HEPA filter and then you should take care because there's a lot of particles that are clogged together. But as long as you don't have any embolism started, I would say no. But uh, one more question here from, what would you recommend for waiting rooms in hospital of tropical disease? Because most people visiting clinics ends up by being there. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a big variation of what we could either, you know, depending on the situation of the hospital that what is required, you could use different type of air cleaners or we could use our HIPAA filters. Uh, so it's very often depends on how it looks. What is the status of, of the existing HVAC? Because we are, we are also filtrating Ebola virus laboratories, but that's a good question. We have many, many questions here. So I think we will do like this. I think we will uh, stop the webinar and you could contact us on aircleaners at canfield.com so we could get more questions and we will come back to you on that. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the webinar and Patrick and I and Neil, Jesper and David, thank you very much for attending the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.